true, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous, I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed them, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was... His eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution. With what foresight. With what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so slightly. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient enough for my head, I put a dark lantern, all closed, closed, that no light shone out. Then I would thrust my head in. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved slowly, very, very slowly, that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray of light fell upon the vulture's eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would be a very profound man, indeed, 
to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moved more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my own sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he, not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch, with a thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fastened through fear of robbers. So I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening. And the old man sprang up out of bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quiet, still, and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move the muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches of the, in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was a groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distract me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him. Although, I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise. When he had turned in the bed, his fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. It is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain because death, in approaching him, had stalked his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel 
although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. But when I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very light crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You could not imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person. For I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of sense? Now I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker, quicker, and louder, and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well that I have told you that I am nervous? So I am. And now, in the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of the old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes, longer, I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart would burst, and now a new anxiety has seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He screeched once, only once. An instant I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and exhumed the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hands upon his heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. 
If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer. When I described the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body, the night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off it, the head, and the arms, and the legs. I then took up three planks from the floor of the chamber, and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind. I had been too wary for that. The tub had caught all. When I had made an end to these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what have I to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicions of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged to the police office, and that they, the police officers, had been dispatched to search the premises. I smiled, for what have I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own, in the dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search and search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues. While I myself, in wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had to convince them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things, but I felt myself getting pale and, and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still chatted. It continued to become more distinct. I, I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued to gain definitiveness until, at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a, and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound much like a sound of as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and that the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more violently, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued with about trifles in a high key with a violent gesticulation but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh, God! What could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and 
grated it upon the boards. But the noise rose over all, and it continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder! And still, the men chattered pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty oh, God! No, no, they heard. They suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This, I think, anything was more tolerable than this in this derision. I can bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, louder, louder! Villains! I dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear apart the planks. Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart.